Well, hello and welcome. I am very excited to bring to you the very next video for this chemistry course, and our focus is going to be on kinetic molecular theory and gas laws. So what we're really going to be focusing on is how do particles move and what factors play a role in how fast those molecules move, as well as their speed, their kinetic energy, in addition to a variety of different gas laws that you're probably already familiar with, but we might just look at them in a little bit of a different perspective. So really excited to bring the video today. Make sure you smash that like button, comment, and subscribe. So without further ado, let's get started. So we have quite a few learning objectives we need to take care of in this video. You should be able to use and apply the ideal gas law. Explain the relationship between moles and pressure. Use and apply Dalton's law of partial pressures. Use graphs to showcase relationships between variables of the ideal gas law. Analyze a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and describe changes in that graph based on temperature. Explain the relationship between kinetic energy of a molecule, its mass and temperature. And also explain how ideal gases differ from real gases. So we've got quite a bit we're going to dive into today. Let's get to the first slide. So clear relationships can be established between the four variables that affect the behavior of a gas. And these four variables include pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. Now, these relationships are given by the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume equals moles times the ideal gas constant times the temperature. Remember that R usually depends on the unit of pressure, but is typically 0 0.0821. And also don't forget that your temperature is in Kelvin. So a lot of problems that you're going to be dealing with have to relate specifically to the ideal gas law. But remember that I can give you temperature in Celsius and you have to convert that to Kelvin or pressure may be given in a different unit that you would need to convert to atmospheres. Or volume may be given in milliliters or cubic centimeters and that would need to be converted into liters. Or I could give you grams and ask you to convert to moles. So there are a variety of different ways that we can ask questions that are specifically related to the ideal gas law. Again, just to reflect, volume must be in liters. Your temperature must be in Kelvin and is moles. And again, we may need to do some conversions. I may give you volume in milliliters and you would have to convert that to liters. I may give you a different unit of pressure. I may give you temperature in Celsius. I may uh, ask for grams instead of moles, or I may give you grams instead of moles and you would have to calculate how many moles would plug into the PV equals NRT equation. So there's lots of different ways that these types of questions can be asked. But as always, when you go through and solve these types of chemistry problems, make sure you write down each individual variable and reflect and think on what types of ways I can convert that in order to fit the equation that I'm working to solve for. So let's briefly take a look at mixtures of a gas. Mixtures of a gas have pressures that are proportional to the number of moles of that gas. So for example, if I have gas A, gas B, and gas C here, and all of them have the same number of moles, let's say that each of those gases is five moles each, then each gas is going to be one third that of the total pressure of the gas. That is, each gas is going to exert one third of the total pressure. Now, again, this is directly related to the number of moles of gas. The ratio of the number of moles of the individual gas to the total number of moles of all of the gases combined together. This is Dalton's law of partial pressures, and it can be used to explain a lot of different properties of individual gases when they are in a mixture. So for example, if we have 2.0 moles of CO2 existing in a 10 mole mixture of two gases, what is the partial pressure of CO2 if the total pressure is 1.90 atm? Well, we have our total pressure, and we also understand that we have two moles of CO2 gas in a 10 mole mixture. Well, that means that carbon dioxide accounts for 20% of the moles of gas that is in the mixture and therefore is going to account for 20% of the partial pressure. So as a result, we take 0 0.20 and we're going to multiply that by 1.90, our total pressure, to get 0.38 atmospheres. That is the partial pressure of CO2, which means we could also go through and calculate the partial pressure of the other gas, which would be 80% of the mixture. So again, it is important to be able to understand that each individual gas, the number of moles that are present, is directly proportional to the partial pressure that that gas exerts. And we can do some mathematical calculations in order to be able to solve for that. Let's move on. So again, we're going to focus on the relationships of gas variables. And we've talked a little bit about this previously by looking at PV equals NRT. I went ahead and rearranged the equation to R equals PV over NT. 
And again, just to kind of reflect on this, if two variables are in the same part of the fraction, the numerator or denominator, they are inversely proportional, meaning that uh, as one increases, the other decreases, such as pressure and volume. But if they are in opposite parts, meaning that one part is in the numerator and the other part is in the denominator of that fraction, then they're directly related to one another. So for example, pressure and temperature is one increases, so does the other, and same with volume and temperature. So it's a real quick and easy way to, again, very quickly look at what happens to one variable of gas when we change another. So let's briefly discuss a little bit about kinetic molecular theory. That is the particles in any sample of matter are always in constant and random motion. That includes solids, liquids, and gases. Now solid molecules are going to move slower than that of liquids and slower than that of gases due to the fact that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. The higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy molecules are going to have. Now the average energy can be calculated using Ke equals one half mv squared, where m is the mass and v is the velocity. So again, we need to think about this is that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So therefore, molecules of the same temperature are going to have the same kinetic energy. Not all molecules are going to move at the same speed, however, because there's another part that's involved with that. However, we do want to remember that temperature measures kinetic energy. So if I have two sets of matter, two sets of gases that have the same temperature, those molecules possess the same average kinetic energy. The velocity, however, is dependent upon temperature and particle size. Smaller particles move faster at the same temperature than larger particles do. And that makes sense. Things with smaller masses at the same temperature uh, with the same energy are going to move faster than those that are larger. So because temperature is a representation of average kinetic energy, we can graph something like this, which is known as a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So let's assume that this is, let's just say, uh, oxygen molecules. And notice the distribution of molecular speed. At 100 Kelvin, the molecular speed is lower than that, at which we would have 300, 600, and 1,000. And notice that it is a range of speeds. Remember, we've talked about average kinetic energy, so therefore we're focusing on average speeds. Not all molecules at the same temperature are going to have the exact same speed. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. Some molecules may be moving faster. Some molecules may be moving slower. But notice a couple things happen with the graph as we increase the temperature. Notice that the peak of the graph shifts to the right, and also notice that the distribution of molecules gets wider. So as we have a higher temperature, we are going to have a greater molecular speed, which makes sense because temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. Uh, and so therefore we would get greater molecular speed as a result. Also the distribution of molecular speeds increases as well. So the peak actually gets smaller as we increase in the amount of temperature and therefore increase the amount of molecular speed. So just some things to think about as we look at a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. There's lots of really great ways we can utilize and interpret these graphs. So let's consider how graphs may shift if the temperature changes or we have two different particles. Uh, remember, different particles have different molar masses. Particles at the same temperature with a larger molar mass are going to have smaller molecular speeds, and therefore the graph may shift depending upon the molar masses as well as the temperature. So let's think about these individually. When the temperature increases, we're gonna see a shift to the right, and the peak will lower as the molecules will, on average, have a higher speed, which results in a larger distribution of the speeds, and the opposite's going to occur when temperature decreases. When temperature decreases, our Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is going to shift to the left, and the peak is going to go up and narrow, because we're going to have fewer distributions of energies. If we increase the temperature, our peak shifts to the right, it gets smaller, but we have a larger, wider distribution of energies. So what happens when we have two different sized particles? That is, two particles which differ in molar mass as well. If the molar mass of one particle is larger than the other, the larger particle will have a smaller distribution of velocities and in general, a lower average speed. So the peaks can be shifted to the left when compared to the smaller molar mass graph. You can even take a look at this and notice this in the middle graph here on the right hand side, carbon dioxide has the largest molar mass of the four gases that are shown in that graph. You see that the peak is furthest to the left because as those are all at the same temperature, they all have the same kinetic energy, but the average speed of carbon dioxide is going to be lower because it has a larger molar mass and therefore moves less with the same kinetic energy as the other molecules. And notice that as the molar mass gets smaller, the peak shifts to the right, the peak gets smaller, but the distribution is larger over the graph. 
So again, there's a variety of different ways that we want to be able to take a look at and interpret these types of graphs. But if we keep these two different shifts in mind, temperature changes and molar mass of the particles, it's very easy to determine how things are going to shift in a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Another thing we want to take a look at is the difference between ideal gas and real gas. And when we talk about ideal gases, we make a couple key assumptions. The first one is that the volume of the container of a real gas is not necessarily the volume of the gas itself. So basically, when we look at the volume of a gas, we assume that it's the same as the volume of the container that it takes place in. That's not necessarily the case with real gases. Furthermore, we ignore all intermolecular attractions. Gases that have stronger intermolecular forces are going to differ from the ideal gas more than those with smaller intermolecular forces. So molecules with more or stronger intermolecular forces are going to behave less like an ideal gas because those molecules are attracted to each other and that plays an impact on the pressure of the gas itself. So we need to think about these things when we're comparing ideal gases to real gases. Gases behave most like an ideal gas when the molecules are small and nonpolar. That's because then the molecules don't interact with each other, and that's an assumption we make when we take into account the ideal gas law. Gases behave most like an ideal gas under high temperatures and low pressures. Reason being is that the gas particles are so far apart from one another, they actually interact very rarely, and so as a result, they're going to behave more like an ideal gas as opposed to a real gas. So... We need to think about these things because you know, we, we've thought about the ideal gas quite a bit. In other chemistry classes, I'm sure you've thought about those as well. We've always had to take a couple caveats in mind when we perform the ideal gas calculation. With the real gas calculation, there's actually quite a few more variables you need to take into consideration, which includes the volume of the actual particles itself, in addition to any interparticle attractions or intermolecular forces that may exist between the particles of the actual gas. So sometimes the pressure, sometimes the volume is going to actually differ because we're not taking those things into consideration. So just some things to kind of keep in mind as you differentiate between your ideal gases and your real ones. So again, we've covered quite a few student learning objectives in this video. Hopefully you can apply concepts of the ideal gas law, understand the relationship between moles and pressure, showcase relationships between variables of an ideal gas law, understand and evaluate Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, and differentiate between kinetic energy of a molecule, its mass and temperature, and differentiate between ideal gases and real gases. Keep these things in mind. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to JLAM Bio. And have a great day. We will see you soon. Goodbye.